fellow humans. Welcome to Brain Mail. I am Dr. Jones. How do our five senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, get inside our skull? Let's think about it by drawing it out. We're going to explore how this information gets inside the skull and then gets to the brain. We can get inside the skull by taking off the top of the skull, which is just basically called the skull cap. It's kind of like a baseball cap, but the way things are named in medicine has usually some historical basis. In this case, there is a very interesting origin for how the skull cap is named. Where was Jesus Christ crucified? Jesus was crucified at a place near Jerusalem called Calvary, which is named so because it has a hill shape. They thought some ancient anatomist that the human skull, the cap, the skull cap has a hill shape. So they took this word Calvary, took out the word Y and called it the Calvarium. That is the name of the skull cap, the Calvarium. When I went to Jerusalem, I visited Calvary and what I remember the most about it is that the priests there were wanting everybody to hustle up. They're like, get out of here. I always confuse the word Calvary with cavalry. Even right now, I'm concentrating so hard to try and say it properly. We just have to mix up some letters. So, ca caval ca cavalry. Cavalry is like, the horse brigade, like the horses in the in the army, everybody, anybody mounted on the horse is in the cavalry. So don't confuse cavalry with cavalry. I mix it up, all, I can't help myself, I just can't get it straight. Now that I've taken the top of the skull off, we can look inside. There are three levels inside the skull, kind of like three floors of a house. And each floor or level has a specific name. The word fossa, F-O-S-S-A, is actually the technical word for that level in the skull. And if you look at the origin of the word fossa, it actually means depression. So it's like a, it's like a depression in the skull. And in fact, from a previous video, I talked about the temple. There's a very shallow fossa right here called the temporal fossa. So it simply means depression. This is a deeper depression. To distinguish these fossa from each other, we call them the front fossa, the middle fossa, and the back fossa, but it's a little more technical than that. The one in the front is called the anterior cranial fossa. That's right here. The one in the middle, like that's one step down actually, is called the middle cranial fossa. And the one at the very back is called the posterior, I'll just steal these letters, Post as in like postscript, post just means the end, postscript of a letter. So this is the posterior cranial fossa. That's how these are technically named. Is that important? That's important if you're in an accident. For example, you can also kind of call them the base of the skull. And if you get a fracture, which is a broken bone, of the base of the skull, it's called a basal skull fracture. The Posterior fossa, because it's so strong, because of this orange uh, occipital bone, it tends not to fracture. So what does tend to fracture is the middle cranial fossa or the anterior cranial fossa. And in 2001, the uh, NASCAR driver, Dale Earnhardt Sr., he died in a crash, a NASCAR crash, and that was because of a basal skull fracture. And afterwards, they introduced a, uh, a device called a HANS, H-A-N-S, which is the head and neck support that is now mandatory for NASCAR drivers. How does what you smell get into the brain? It gets into the brain by the nerve of smell. It has a very fancy name, of course. The nerve of smell is called the olfactory nerve. Hundreds of thousands of branches, tiny little branches of this nerve enter the skull through about 40 tiny holes. And if we look at the anterior cranial fossa, to get technical, at this little pink bone here, there are about, you can't really see them in this model, there are about 20 holes on this side, 20 holes on this side. And that's how all that smell gets into the brain. It's not the smell that's getting into your brain, like fried eggs is not getting into your brain. It's the electrical impulses in the olfactory nerve that are now inside the brain. 
This pink bone is called the ethmoid bone. There are holes in this bone, just like a sieve. The anatomists of like 2000 years ago named this area of the bone simply because it resembled a sieve. Roughly speaking, the Latin word for sieve is cribriform. So these holes in the ethmoid bone, they all are under this term cribriform plate. So the cribriform plate is part of the pink ethmoid bone. And that's how smell gets into our brain. I smashed my head really hard on the ground once. I was swinging into my friend's basement, holding onto this railing and the railing broke off and I went bam, really hard onto my head. And when you do that sort of thing, all those nerve fibers coming in through this sieve, through the cribriform plate, they can actually get sheared or injured. And that altered my sense of smell, which is just a bit off now as a result of this smashing my head injury. Even though it looks like light is going inside the skull, which it is on this skull that's been removed from a body and has no tissues in it, that's not actually what happens. No light gets inside. In fact, what happens is that if this is the eyeball and it is sitting in here, the back of the eyeball is called the retina. There's a layer back there called the retina, which actually absorbs all the light, which is technically photons. And there is in fact a black layer of pigment in the eye that actually absorbs stray photons. So that's one reason that light doesn't get inside the skull. And the other is that the little hole in the back of the eyeball, which I'll get to in a second for the optic nerve, is stuffed so full of tissue that no light is gonna get past there. In the same way that the ethmoid bone had little holes in it to let the nerve of smell, the olfactory nerve, into the skull, this yellow bone here that actually has the shape of a butterfly is how the sense of sight gets into the skull. This yellow colored bone in the shape of a butterfly is called the sphenoid bone. Now, let's take a look at the eye. Here's one eye. Coming off the back of the eye is what's known as the optic nerve. The optic nerve is able to get into the brain because there is a hole in the sphenoid bone. The little butterfly has a hole in it for the optic nerve. And I'm going to just show the optic nerve in yellow here coming through the optic canal. So here's the eyeball, there's a nerve on the back of it. And so this is vision going into the brain through this hole called the optic canal. To make that perfectly clear, light goes into the eyeball, is transformed into electrical impulses in the optic nerve, which then travels through the optic canal in the sphenoid bone, and that's how it gets inside the brain. In an earlier video I talked about in Game of Thrones, there was a scene where the cocky Spaniard gets a thumb shoved into his eye and he bleeds out his eye. And that is this artery here, which is called the ophthalmic artery. I'll spell it, it's a fancy word. Once again, such a complicated word to spell. I think this is the most difficult word for me to spell in all of medicine, ophthalmic artery. Whenever I spell it, even to this day, after like years of medicine, I have to say out loud, O-P-H-T-H. Uh, otherwise, I screw up the spelling. So it's the ophthalmic artery that supplies the eyeball. So there's one for the right eyeball, the right ophthalmic artery, and one on, there would be a left optic canal also serving the left eyeball, so this would be the left ophthalmic artery, hence right and left ophthalmic artery. Okay. A particularly interesting feature of the sphenoid bone is this little depression within the bone. It's like a fossa within a fossa. It's kind of like inception, a dream within a dream, except it's not called a fossa. It actually has a very interesting name. <laughs> The Turkish Saddle. The Turkish Saddle has a fascinating origin in terms of its name. The anatomists at the time of the Roman Empire, let's say 100 AD, they named things after, of course, what was in their, in their time. And despite their massive wealth, the Roman Empire did not seemingly have saddles for their horses. They had these budget cloths that they would put on the horse. And they had to look to Turkey, who seemed to be spending money on saddles, and they saw this, 
from a Turkish saddle and said, this looks exactly like a Turkish saddle. More fascinating, this pea-sized object right here sits in the pea-sized Turkish saddle. What is the name of this fascinating little thing? This pea-sized object is the pituitary gland. It's called the master gland. It secretes eight hormones. Hormones are substances secreted into the blood that have an effect on usually a distant organ. For example, at the time of puberty, the pituitary gland secretes a lot of growth hormone, turning a girl into a woman and a boy into a man. And let's just show how the pituitary actually sits in there. I'm gonna cut the brain in half here and let's hope this guy stays together. There's the pituitary gland sitting inside the Turkish saddle. Not too far from Italy is Egypt. Long before these Roman anatomists were naming the brain, the ancient Egyptians were taking brains out of their pharaohs. How did they do it? They would take Something like this, which is actually like a cuticle, um, cuticle fixer-upper, and they would put it into the nasal cavity on either side of the nasal septum, it didn't seem to matter, and they would go straight up into the bottom of the sphenoid bone, punch a hole through it, and then bring all the brains out that way and stick it in a jar. Let's look at that in a little detail. Here's a photo of a skull that's been sawed straight down the middle and here's the upper jaw, the lower jaw, there's the teeth, this is the nasal cavity here and this little depression, that is the Turkish saddle. So they would essentially come in through the nasal cavity, punch a hole through the sphenoid bone here and it didn't necessarily have to be specifically at the Turkish saddle and inside the brain and now scoop the brains out and bring them out the nose. Good for the Egyptians. Fast forwarding to the 21st century, human beings then as now get tumors of the pituitary gland. So the pituitary gland has a tumor. Who does something about that? A neurosurgeon. They do the same thing as the Egyptians, but just with more caution, because it doesn't matter if the pharaoh dies, he's already dead. The neurosurgeon really wants his patient to stay alive. So it's the same, the same concept where the neurosurgical tool is inserted in the nasal cavity and through the sphenoid and that part of the pituitary gland, just that small part that has the tumor is actually basically pinched off, it's removed and whatever area that was removed, the hormones that it was making are actually replaced afterwards. So it's called hormone replacement therapy. And it's got a very specific name. The technical name for this procedure by the neurosurgeon is called the transsphenoidal approach. Approach in surgery just means like, literally how are you going to approach this surgical area? Trans means across, like transatlantic, going across the Atlantic. So trans means that the instrument is going to go through or across the sphenoid bone. So in that surgery, it's gonna go inside the nose, in the nasal cavity, and through the base of the sphenoid, and that little portion of the pituitary gland that has the tumor is gonna be removed. I have no idea how this is actually accomplished. I've just read about it. I've never been present in that surgery. I would not have a clue how to do it. I'd be more like those Egyptians and I would just need to do this on an already dead person. Moving on to the back of the skull. In the interior here is the occipital bone. It's got a big hole in the bottom. It's called the foramen magnum. What's gonna come through the foramen magnum? Sensory information, mostly in the form of touch. Anything you touch is going to come through here, through the spinal cord and into the brain. Touch from the face is a little more complicated, but generally speaking, everything is gonna go through the um, foramen magnum for touch getting inside the brain. And there's the rest of the occipital bone on the bottom of the skull. This is still the basal part of the skull here, and that technically is the interior. Have you ever heard the expression, in one ear, out the other? Sound goes in a hole in the temporal bone, which is in blue here, 
and into a canal in the temporal bone. The name of this canal, which is about one inch long, is the external acoustic canal. And sound goes in that canal and inside this area of the temporal bone, which has a pretty prominent status inside the skull, in this very protected solid area is where sound is translated into nerve impulses in the acoustic nerve. Those nerve impulses in the acoustic nerve are now going to go inside the skull through another hole, and that other hole is here. The name of this canal is the internal acoustic canal. I had to steal some ends there to make that. So in the grand scheme of things, in the big picture, sound goes into this one inch canal, the external acoustic canal, goes into this very solid portion of uh, the temporal bone. The sound is converted into nerve impulses in the acoustic nerve and now emerges through this hole on the inside of the skull in the temporal bone still called the internal acoustic canal. Very technical stuff, but that's exactly how it happens. It's your body, you should know how it works. I didn't really talk about taste. Taste is a little more complicated. It gets into the brain by three different major nerves and some of that sense of taste goes through the form and magnum and into the brain. So that's uh, that's basically the skull. You've come a long way and uh, we'll be marching forward now to the actual brain that lives inside here. So thanks for watching so far and don't forget to subscribe and we'll catch you next time. Ciao. To make that perfectly clear, the optic inner... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> And to read, a, to read <laughs> uh, of this pink bone, which is the ethmoid bone. I just repeated stuff again and again there, right? You might think that light shining into the skull, that's not really the case, but let's just think about how it, Oh, that was so good. Uh -huh. That was good. That was going so well. Okay. Okay, from the top.